Welcome to the Art Africa podcast, a platform that uses the power of storytelling to reimagine the African narrative. We are Afro optimists and deep believers in the African continent, using dialogue to celebrate African excellence, especially that of African women. I am Lona Okeng. I am Olga Chichoncho. And we are the builders of Arch Africa. We're so excited and very honored to host Dr. Olive Kobusinje, who has played such a pivotal role in Uganda's healthcare industry. She has a very long, long <laughs> resume. Lona, I think we spent, how long did we spend reading her resume? It was <laughs> even trying to reduce and say, okay, wh what can we add? What can we, I mean, what, what do we put what do, does everyone have, have to know? But there's like pages and pages and material. Um, everything is so complex and everything is so fantastic. There is a um, there is a there is a the, the epidemiologist surgeon, um, but there is also the accident and emergency. I think the accident and emergency surgeon. But then there is also multiple multiple roles that um, that she has. She has partic not I can't even say participated that have that sit on her resume yeah. and, um, you know, being an advisory with the World Health, World Health Organization um, amongst, amongst so many. So many things. So many things. So the many terminology things. is yeah. very complex. Please. So we are we're in a better... Is, uh, uh, no, let no, us, no, no. First, let us For introduce us. you. Okay. <laughs> we are the captain here. So <laughs> um, She's also played such a pivotal role as a pioneer, um, having set up the first um, injury and prevention center in Uganda. Yeah. Do people even know that? No. Um, she came up with uh, the first accident registry. Um, I think it's called the Kampala Trauma Score, KTS, mm. which has been adopted to other law and medium. Uh, I've actually read Yes. It. Like, I, eh, we had Across to read. Across 46 we countries. We read the patient. <laughs> We're like, wow, we have to read and understand what, you know, what, what, um, what your life story has been mm. over the years. But also because healthcare is such a central role to um, the, fun I would say the functioning of any human being so yeah. may i have mad respect to doctors because yeah. <laughs> you do things which conventionally um other people can't do um and she's also the co-founder of this amazing mm -hmm. space that we're in the, the great, great outdoors, outdoors. <laughs> She's also authored these two amazing books, um, The Patient and The Correct Line. So guys, please check them out um, on Mahiri Books um, for, you know, if you want to purchase them and learn more about not just her story, but then the journey of um, Uganda's, um, well, how Uganda has evolved to be where it is. Okay, so getting down to business. <laughs> <laughs> um, with this very colorful, um, you know, career that you've built over the years, we're just curious to know back to your childhood days. Um, what would you say is your fondest childhood memory? Uh, thank you very much, Olga. Um, and thank you, Alana. It's uh, first of all to say, well, I guess when you, when you ask somebody, can we talk to you about your life or your career? they don't necessarily go through the years thinking okay so this is that that you know i guess so so hearing you say that and that you actually read all of those things uh interesting and i appreciate that what are my fondest childhood memories 
Um, so this is a long time ago, right? <laughs> yeah. I guess I was one of those kids that, you know, t I, this is a great outdoors. And even as a child, I remember being an outdoors child. I remember, you know, running around a lot, um, climbing trees, uh, making friends, lots of friends in the village. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I grew up in a very rural area in Rukunjiri. So it was, it's, it's really thinking back to those times when I didn't have a care. You know, I made friends, enjoyed friends. We spent whatever holidays we had outdoors. We didn't spend hardly any time indoors because we didn't have the gadgets that kids have today. We had our friends to play with when we played with the things that were around us. We climbed trees, we played ball. Um, I went to boarding school when I was quite young, which was unusual those days. Um, I went to Hombe High School, which it says Hombe High School, but actually it was um, like an elementary school, like a primary school. And again, just the friends, reading books. Uh, I was an early avid reader, so um, I, I remember that. I remember, you know, exchanging books with friends. And, and you know, that was childhood. Yeah, it wasn't. I, I feel sad that kids these days, there's such an intensity around passing exams. We didn't have that. Mm -hmm. We read mostly to enjoy what we read. Yeah, we were, you know, we had to be serious about school, but it wasn't all. Uh, I, I think these days we see kids that almost leave for school. I'm glad that I didn't live in that period that, you know, I, we actually enjoyed being kids mm -hmm. and playing. And, and then we did school and then we played some more. And then we read an interesting book and, and then we played some more. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think, you know, playing, having friends, reading books that I truly enjoyed, I think that's what I, I recall. Mm -hmm. um, I had siblings. I was fifth in a, a family of six kids. So uh, those days people had large families. Ugandans still had large, have large families. So <laughs> I was close to the tail end, which means that I had very little responsibility, which suited me perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. So um, it sounds like <clears throat> the village, we call it the village, right? Which is the community and the family that was responsible for nurturing you to be the person that you are today. Um, are there some core values that you probably began to form and shape with that experience uh, very early on in your childhood that, you know, have carried you to be the person that you are today? Um... I suppose they were, but I think when you're a child, there are things that you pick up without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody sits you down to say, I, I'm going to tell you about sharing, mm -hmm. or I'm going to tell you about caring. But I think you grow up in an environment where you share a lot and you don't quickly own and privatize things and make them just your own. Nobody touches my phone. I think we shared a lot mm -hmm. and we also cared for each other. Um, and I think that might seem somewhat trivial, but I think as I've grown older, I've realized that it's, we don't take it for granted, caring mm. for people that you don't even, you're not related to them. Mm. They j are just people in your space. I think um, that you're concerned for their welfare, that you share what you have with them. Mm. Um, I think that um, probably came from my, my childhood living in a community that wasn't maybe too, um, did, didn't, you know, shared, you know, plenty. And, and yeah, I would say that. I also think um, as I grew older and watching some of the people, the, the older people around me and seeing how um, they treated other people, but also how they treated their responsibilities um, around work. But then again, sometimes you, you look back and you say, did I really pick that from so-and-so? Or did I, was it intentional? Did they necessarily expose me to this 
Probably not. Mm. Yeah. You've mentioned something very fascinating about um, the sense of community um, and learning from um, from the surrounding and the people that you grew up with. And um, we've been bounced speaking about um, just looking back at life and we've termed that destiny helpers. Like there are certain people who, if you look back um, through your life's journey, you would say they played a very pivotal role um, um, in really shaping you and guiding you and escorting you on this this journey, would you how who would you describe as your main life's <laughs> destiny helpers destiny across helper. the different wow. phases of life? Yes, wow, well, destiny helpers. Um, I, I guess for most people, those might be their parents. Unfortunately, I lost my parents when I was quite small. Yeah, my dad died. Um, when I was five and my mom died when I was 11. So I really didn't, um, the, actually the one thing that I remember from my mom, and it wasn't just her, I think it was the grown-ups of those days was something about you don't tell lies. Mm -hmm. No, that was a no, you didn't. I mean, if you, if you told lies, you would have grief mm -hmm. and you quickly learned that you don't lie um now we think yeah if you're smart maybe you can get away with it but yeah in my childhood you didn't get away with anything lying mm -hmm. you also didn't get away with taking things that you that you hadn't been given mm -hmm. that yeah. <laughs> no, no 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 you didn't lie you didn't just take stuff yeah. and if you were given something you said thank you mm -hmm. And in, in our language, you know, th she was very quick to say, if you took something and you didn't say thank you, she'd say, are you a hyena? <laughs> I, well, like, so who knows about hyenas and whether they are grateful or not? Mm -hmm. But you, so you quickly got to know those things that, you know, you appreciate when people do things for you or give you something. Mm -hmm. You don't lie and you don't take stuff that doesn't belong to you. Uh, it's very basic, right? Yeah, but very basic. but you now you think back and you say, well, if Ugandans didn't take things that didn't belong to them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 and if they didn't lie, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and not just Ugandans, yeah. anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, coming back to the destiny, destiny yeah. helpers, yeah. I think for me, in the absence of of my parents, I think some of those people would have to be my older siblings. Mm -hmm. Um, my my biggest sister and my big brother. Mm -hmm. um, other destiny helpers would probably be um, like some of my teachers maybe, but for sure my siblings, mm -hmm. um, my big brother, mm -hmm. uh, my sister, they would have been. And then as I grew much older, you know, my teachers mm -hmm. and, and then those that now getting into my careers, maybe my professors but yeah as a child i think it's those people that would be close to you that um that that made the bigger world beyond my home and beyond our school uh less threatening mm -hmm. you know that there's somebody that knows about the big world that mm. they go out there and they come home and they know things you don't. Mm. They've been to places you haven't been, but because they've been and back, then you know that those places there exist. You can also one day go there. Yeah. You can also become that person, yeah. you know. So maybe they're not necessarily the big destiny helper, but I think in a way they are. And I think in my case, they were mm. those people. And you've spoken about your, your, your elder brother um, also playing a very pivotal role in guiding you through your career journey. Um, but your, pref your first choice was engineering, but he, he advocated <laughs> that, um, you know, I think medicine would be best, um, best suited um, for you. What's the story behind the engineering? Well, so the story, actually, it's not much of a story. So these days, kids know about all manner of professions and, and choices they can make. They can be you know, a hundred different things. When we were young, we didn't know about all of those things. They weren't, so really, if you are a smart kid, 
you can count off your one hand the kind of things that you could do. You know, you could become a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, um, you know, maybe two other things. And so we, we were pretty limited in, in the scope of, you know, you could become a pilot. Now, that was a special one, you know, like people, and we had never seen a pilot, some of us, so we could only imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so, but uh, as I say, I read a lot. So some of the people that I would encounter, some of the characters that I would encounter would have been people that made things, you know, like engineers, they make things and they have to be super smart. Mm -hmm. And so I had never talked to an engineer to tell me about this is what we do and this is how we do it and this is how, but I, it, for me it, it, it sounded like, like a very smart thing to be, like you're an engineer, you know, you make things. It, it was like science, you know, like, and, and so that's what I had in mind uh, in wanting to be an engineer is to create things, to do things in, sci in the field of science. I was one of those kids that I, so school for me was not a big challenge. I, you know, I did school and I, in class, I would be very attentive and outside of class, I didn't read much, but I would have, you know, I would have learned all of what I wanted to. Are, are you those people who used to absorb from the blackboard? Because our, our <laughs> friend Lona here is, she's those people would sit that she tries teaching she absorbs yeah. from the blackboard and during prep time she's reading she's either doing art or reading a book so so yeah so i i listened <laughs> i am quite visual but i also have a good ear so for me school wasn't difficult um but when it came to and so and i read you know i was I got into trouble for reading under my table when somebody was boring or during prep if they thought we should be doing homework. And I'd done my homework in like the first 10 minutes and finished it. So I, I was always reading novels. In fact, it became a bit of a, so some of my teachers thought I should, oh, you know, she's doing history wonderfully. She's, you know, very good at English literature. So she should, maybe she should think of a, a career in law. Mm. I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to be a scientist. Mm. Yeah. So, so anyway, so there wasn't really much of a story. But to get back to your point, so when I, when I told my family, my brother especially, that I wanted to be an engineer, he was like, oh, no, you're going to have grief. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> in Makere, <laughs> girls don't pass engineering. They don't go there. Yeah. And he had a few other friends that also, you know, mm. said the same thing. And, and they said, no, you really don't want to do that. Mm. So... So having been told I, it wasn't a good idea to, do, to be an engineer, now the next one, still as a scientist, was to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back then you didn't think about uh, IT, you know, those things weren't on our radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so that's how I, I ended up in medicine. And even in medicine, it's interesting. So, so then I thought, okay, so I, I'm going to be a doctor. So... Some of the, my most fascinating uh, times, stories, were detective stories. And if you remember those detective stories, they always had somebody that cracked the case. Yes. And they were either uh, a forensic pathologist, you know, they analyzed something, a sample of blood or something. Or, yeah, exactly. And so when you're a child, you're thinking these are really yeah. cool things, you know. So, uh, so when I went into medicine, I was thinking about that. I was thinking, oh, you know, to know the wonders of the mind mm -hmm. and to even be able to tell about what is that person thinking. So what was the criminal thinking before they... So I even thought, okay, I'm going to be a, either a forensic scientist or I'm going to be a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was so funny. Wow. Because... Right, right. Yeah, and then yeah. I went into medicine and and went through the first two years which you know are non-clinical years you're doing what we call the basic sciences you know you're doing your physiology your anatomy your pathology and then i started to encounter the people that were doing those samples and my goodness i, was, I knew like in a heartbeat <laughs> that I, there's absolutely no way <laughs> no way <laughs> I I wanted like, to yes no right. they were a special yeah. kind of people. Uh, yes absolutely <laughs> i mean we appreciate them but i wasn't going to be one of them okay even psychiatry, I remember we had a rotation in psychiatry in my third year. And in the first week, I realized that these 
I, I didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, once the rotation was done, I never went back there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a way it's as a child, uh, you know, you come to these, you know, decisions mm -hmm. uh, with somewhat limited information. Um, and these days I think we are being more intentional about exposing kids to different careers. You know, if somebody says, I, I think I want to be a psychiatrist, I say, do, are you know a psychiatrist? Do you want to shadow them? Yeah. Do you want to go and see where they work? Yeah. Maybe they can tell you what, you know, what their work is about. Yeah. Or if I want to be an anthropologist, I say, do you know what an anthropologist does? You know, read about it and I'll introduce you to a real life anthropologist. Yeah. In our time, that wasn't there. We just, you know read books and figured, oh, this is a really cool thing. Go for it, mm. you know. So anyway, that's how I ended up in medicine. Oh, wow. Building on that momentum, how did you then carve the path, the speciality in the profession? What was that um, tipping point? Yeah, tipping point. So I, I went through medical school and I was a very you know, a very focused student. These days, medical students are also having time to go and do 10 other things. I don't know where they find the time. In our time, <laughs> we were <laughs> first, second, and end medical students. Mm -hmm. We didn't do anything else but medicine. And so I went through med school, no problems. And I came out at the tail end not entirely sure what I wanted to specialize in. Like there were certain things that interested me in PIDs. There was some, you know, mm -hmm. so I still had an open mind. And then I went into my internship and I, I, I remember my obstetrics and gynecology rotation <laughs> and it was very intense. And there's something we call fetal distress, like the, fe the, the unborn baby yeah. is distressed. And what I remember from that rotation was, we always joked that there was fetal distress, there was intern distress. Like our in we were distressed as interns. Yeah. But also it became pretty monotonous because you're doing the exact same thing you did yesterday, the day before. Or or. So uh, I, it wasn't very attractive to me. But I came to surgery. And I think this is what you would call an inflection point. Mm -hmm. I came to surgery. I'd rotated through as a med student, but as an intern, when you actually have responsibility for patients, that you see patients, you talk to them, you clerk, you take their histories, you determine what, what investigations you're going to do right away, which ones need your consultant, you look after the patient and you prep them for theatre, you take them to the OR, you participate in the operation. And there was this amazing guy, I did my internship in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So those days you could finish your med school, get on a bus, go to Nairobi, go to Afia House and do an, an interview for an internship, so which is preci precisely what I did. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I was interning with this amazing surgeon. And in the first week I just fell in love with this work, you know, he he was an, a, a very fine surgeon, really fine surgeon. So I knew that I wanted to do what he was doing. So I, I think I think surgery was my second rotation, and I knew when I finished that I was just going to go to all those other places, but I was coming back here. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was an important. Yeah, he was called Mohammed Al Kama. He was a really amazing surgeon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think he set me on the path to becoming what I did, yeah, so. He, and then, of course, I became, I, so I first trained as a surgeon. And when I finished training as a surgeon and, and you know, was posted to a general surgical ward, I was there for a very short time. And back then, the accident and emergency wasn't a place where people liked to work because, um, and the workload, uh, yeah, so, but during my time in training, something attracted me to that place that, you know, it's, it, it looks chaotic, mm. but really there is method in the madness. You, you can very quickly sort things <laughs> that look absolutely horrific yeah. and you can, you know, by doing the right things, you can sort this mess. Mm. So for me, that, that was the attraction. Mm. So I actually requested to be sent there and they were very happy. <laughs> Please, <laughs> want, want to make sure. go there, stay there as long as you want. 
So, so I went to the accident and emergency, and uh, I worked under a more senior surgeon, two senior surgeons that were very good for me. One was Mr. Wari, and another one was, unfortunately, his past, Mr. Ezati. They were very good for me. And so I went to this place where I now had the skills to then turn that chaos into order. And, and so for me, that, that was really, you know, what kept me going, that you see people that are brought in half dead. And if you do the right thing, in the next few hours or several hours, they are going to be sitting up. Mm. They are going to be talking. In the next few days, they're going to walk out of that hospital. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, so for me, those were powerful moments. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And this was still in Kenya? No, this was in Uganda. So yeah, so I returned here to do my, um, my uh, residency, my master's in, in surgery. And uh, I was fortunate to train under a very good surgeon. So Mr. Alkama was special because, as I said, he, I watched him, I assisted him. It was a joy to scrub for him. Mm. You know, mm. like sometimes you're tired, you really want to go home, but if Alkama says he has a case, yeah. you're more than happy to come back and scrub and work with him. Mm. That's how good he was. That's wonderful. Yeah. What, what, what uh, year was this? What, what, this uh, was nine. 1988, 89, yeah, yeah. So towards the later end of the Right, right. Yeah, because yeah, remember we were in med school as undergrads during, so the five years that the NRA spent in the bush, we spent in medical school. Mm -hmm. And when we were just about to exit, they came, they arrived. So, so we then, uh, so then I did my internship, and then I started my residency. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and so I came and I trained under you know, very good surgeons again. Mr. Kamiya, he's again passed. Mm. Um, as a, as a um, resident, my supervisor, my main supervisor was um, a surgeon called Jesse Sally. We used to call him JC, John Chrysostom Sally. Mm. He was certainly older than the guy that, you know, made me love surgery. And he somewhat took me under his wing. So initially I came to the department. So in between there, in between my, I, so I did my first year as a resident and then I went off to London and did an, an MSc. Mm -hmm. And when I returned, there was a discussion as to whether they should allow me back into the program. Cause they said, mm, you want to be a surgeon? You want to go off and do something else? Maybe not. But he, so he took me in and supervised me and I learned tons of stuff from him. Um, yeah, so I think it's working with and under people that loved their job, that loved what they did, but they also were um, very good teachers, mm -hmm. you know, very unselfish, very, you know, giving of themselves and, and and you, telling you you could do it, I'll stand and watch you. If you need me to come in, I'll come in, but I know you're going to be able to do it, you know. So, so I was very privileged to, to learn under some of those people. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I think for some of the timelines that you've described, especially, um, you know, coming back in the later 80s, um to uganda um just trying to reflect on what uganda was like um <clears throat> at the time that you had you know you were in school for those five years what the chaos that was happening around uh some of the i would say poly it wasn't really a policy but it was more of a uh you know idi amin just woke up one day and is like asians out right and how the effects of some of those decisions um you know from a some of the decisions that the leaders at the time were taking and their spillover effects into the medical space right so what was the aftermath of of the the expulsion of asians in the 70s what was the aftermath of um the civil war going on in the 80s um and also you know the start of the 90s the aids card hits so i'm like ah, at what <laughs> i'm like when do people like take a breath right <laughs> um, yeah so when i mean um was president uh well in many ways i was too young to know exactly what was going on mm. but then uh, the the repercussions of that were certainly around when i grew up you know, so 
So for instance, when we came to medical school, um, so previously there'd been a lot of internationally trained people as part of, of academia or faculty. So Mackay had uh, a lot of international faculty, um, Asians for sure. Um, and then in 72, when they were expelled, um, like half of the clinical departments lost their department heads because they, they were Indian, they were Asian. Mm -hmm. And they simply just walked out of Mulago never to return. And so younger Ugandans who were around were immediately forced to take on those responsibilities. Um, but it wasn't just that people left, it was that the outside world started to look at Uganda as a really dangerous place and one where you could not invest. So for instance, uh, the Albert Cook Library, which you may or may not have seen, but it's um, it's a very old, it's an, an old library in the medical school. It was previously like one of the medical libraries on the continent. And during that time, they, you know, we lost subscriptions and it came to a point when nothing was coming in from the outside. So whatever journals had existed were the only ones that were there. And even then some were having you know, their pages ripped out. Um, so it, it's taken a very long time to rebuild some of that. Yeah, so as, um, as a graduate student, as a student specializing in surgery, there were certain things that I would have wished to have, but the years of erosion had ensured that those things were not there. And so many of those things were being rebuilt during that time. Um, so for instance, having uh, faculty come in from other universities uh, was a rarity because you know people didn't come to Uganda there was trouble there was war there was a threat of the, you know there was always something going on mm -hmm. that discouraged people and likewise Ugandans going to outside universities if they left they didn't come back mm -hmm. yeah so that uh, had an impact on the development of um, of health workers of the health profession um, but I have to say that uh, from 86, 87, when, you know, the world now sort of got reassured that, you know, these are safe shores, you can come here, you won't get shot at, um, and, and, you know, Asians were being welcomed back. So there was, and there continues to be a rebuilding. Mm -hmm. But you know those va those values that you talked about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Some of those are much more difficult to rebuild than the mere subscription to a journal or buying computers and putting them in a room. Is that some of those values were eroded, and it takes a long time to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, students that can be entrusted with resources in a library that if nobody's watching, you still won't rip out a page or walk out with a book that doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. That's still a challenge, it's still a challenge, yeah. So I think some of the, of the opportunities that I got uh, and I've been truly thankful is that, um, is that I, I've been able to train at different uh, institutions, different universities, because my career can give you only so much. Mm -hmm. and, it's, oh, and even for other people who are you know, at top-notch universities, the exchange is healthy to go to a different institution, to, to sit under different faculty, to experience something different. So as I said, between my uh, MBCHB and my uh, MMED, my master's in, in, in medicine and surgery, I did an MSc at the University of London. Mm -hmm. And there were things that I learned there that I, I could never have learned at Makere because those resources didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, the teaching methods were different. Uh, they had this amazing library. So, I, I, as you can probably tell, I love books. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's you love books. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I went into this library and, and I was amazed. I said, uh, this is all here for me. I have access to everything, you know. I, oh, I mean, that was special. Uh, and then, of course, you could even have access to it remotely. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there are those those facilities that I have had the privilege of, of, you know, having access to that then formed me in a different way than if all I had was Ugandan exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I later went to the University of New York in Albany, and again, it was a different learning experience. Um, 
different kinds of, of um, experiences. You talked of the kind of people that would have been destiny helpers. Helpers, helpers yeah. yeah. So in New York, I met a lady. Um, she was called Professor Susan Stanfast. And for some reason, she took an interest in what I wanted to do. So in my year, like I was already a surgeon. So she wanted, what, you're a surgeon, you were coming to do public health. What is your interest in this? And I had spent, you know, I'd spent time at Mulago and seen the horrors of injuries. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody walks out of their home in the morning in perfect health and ends up in the accident and emergency and we take off their leg or something shocking like that, you know. So for me, the idea that you can do something to prevent injuries or if you can't prevent them entirely, you can do something to improve outcomes for patients. Mm -hmm. That you can better the system so that a person who has this kind of injury has a pretty good chance of getting back to work in a few months. Mm -hmm. So I met that lady and her specialty was injury prevention. I, before I went to New York, I didn't know there was such a, there was such a, a specialty. Mm -hmm. And so she was a destiny changer. Mm -hmm. You know, so she, she was my supervisor mm -hmm. and she exposed me to so much that I hadn't known before. And she, and so I got a job with the New York State um, Department of Health and worked in their injury prevention um, department and really learned a lot in a fairly short period of time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I could bring back. In fact, when I came back, she came to visit to see if I had been successful in setting up the unit that I talked about. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I think it's some of those experiences that shaped who I became over time mm -hmm. and um, it's, I, I like I encourage my students, my former students, I say, if you have an opportunity to go and experience something different, go. Yeah. If I can point you in that direction, if I can give you a reference, if I can interest an, an, a former you know, colleague to take you on, I'll do that because I know how it changes young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Building on that because there's multiple segments of her, you know. Unpacking, like, right. Yes, unpacking. Cause there, there is one thing I want to say as we unpack, uh -huh. right? So Lona's values are, Lona, what are your values? I don't negotiate with liars and thieves. <laughs> <laughs> you don't negotiate with a whole lot of Uganda. No, no, that's like, that's like people tell me, what am I deal breakers? I say, it's yeah. simple. They are liars, just two. Thieves. Just don't steal, don't lie. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. And then people are like, but now that's too big. Just yeah. don't steal, don't yes, lie. Yes, yeah. We are good. Yeah. It's too simple. So when she was saying it, I was, yeah. like, I was like, I'm not a lawyer. I was <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the liars and thieves thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I want just on building on what you're saying, because there's the trained medic, trained me medical doctor, then the surgeon, and then you become now the, the injury specialist. Mm -hmm. Epidemiology is a diff like a kind of um, like a specialty on is it pathogens or something. Yeah. How does that then? How did that then get plugged into in this? Because like those are multiple specialties. Right, it's like right. a remix. <laughs> like all the doctors. That's in, all the doctors. in one place. All right, all right, right. So this is what it is. Yes. So, so first I was a doctor, general doctor. Then I was a surgeon. Then I was focused on accident and emergency. And so you're right to ask because the first epidemiologists and and usually when you say you're an epidemiologist what comes to most people's minds even within the health sector mm -hmm. is that you're dealing with d diseases mm -hmm. disease patterns uh, you know and they're not thinking injuries as a disease mm -hmm. they're thinking malaria tuberculosis Virus. hiv aids yeah. Yeah. right yeah. But really, what epidemiology does is that it allows you to study disease patterns. It allows you to study causation. It allows you to study what makes these diseases thrive in a population. What reduces the chances of thriving? In other words, what prevents them? How can you, um, how can you overcome that specific disease? Mm -hmm. So uh, when I talked to Professor Susan Stanford, so she was one of the first few uh, doctor, she, was, she was a doctor that, she, that went into public health and that started to look at injuries as a disease, mm -hmm. 
and to say, in the same manner that you study causation of malaria, you can study the causation of injuries. You can figure out what factors lead to someone having a road traffic crash, an injury. Because it's not an accident. Mm -hmm. And so we, in this field, we say injuries are not accidents. Mm -hmm. They are predictable and they are preventable. And so we study those factors. We, you know, not all drivers are going to end up crashing. Some drivers are, are more likely to crash and we can predict that. We can predict who is likely to be in a crash, where they are likely to be in a crash, and what severity of a crash they're going to be in and what their outcomes are going to be. This is what I study. <laughs> this is my specialization. So, it, so you're right that it is a specialization on top of a specialization. And it enables me to then say, what do we need to do to prevent so many Ugandans from dying on the roads? What do we need to fix? Is it the road? Is it the person driving? Is it this sociocultural environment? So for instance, are people more likely to say, you've had a few beers, but oh no, it's okay. If it wasn't your day, you're going to be fine. You know, that kind of belief. Uh, or are we completely intolerant of drunk drivers so that it's an absolute no-go, you know? Or are we, mm, you know, you had a few beers, but it's not too bad, really, and it's a short distance, and, 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 and you're a minister, and so we look the other way, yeah. you know? So society can promote injuries without even realizing it. Or what kind of vehicles do we allow on our roads, you know? What kind of junk are people willing to put on the road mm -hmm. as their transportation? Mm -hmm. and, and what is the police officer going to allow to pass? So it's, it's almost like more policy driven, a policy driven form of medicine. Mm -hmm. so the pub, the public well, so health. public health, yeah. yeah so, so it's not just for this field. Even when you're thinking HIV AIDS, you study the virus, you study how it treats the body, what the body can do to overcome the virus, what kind of medicines can we give. But ultimately you're thinking, how can we prevent this from being the case? How can we disrupt transmission? Or if somebody has, had, has contracted the disease, how can we prevent them from becoming patients, from being sick from this virus? So in, and, and so that should direct policy, should direct policy on a whole lot of things, mm -hmm. you know. It, we, we have policy on, on uh, whether to use uh, certain types of chemicals for, for mosquitoes. We have policies mm -hmm. on what kind of waters should, water we should allow in institutions. Mm -hmm. so likewise, we have policies and they should be based on research. So, so that's what led me into research, that we can't just come up with a policy and say, oh, by the way, if a car is more than seven years, we shouldn't allow it into the country. Mm. Where did you get that? What data tells you that after seven years, that car becomes more dangerous? You know, is eight more magically different? Is it different from six? Mm. So there must be data, there must be research that advises that if you put this type of vehicle on the road, you're increasing the chances of having a crash. Mm. Or if you allow people to drive when they're 17, they're more likely to crash than if you wait until they're 21. Mm. Or if you have taken more than one glass of wine, you're more likely to crash than if you have taken, you know. So all those policies should be based on evidence. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. You know, people come up with, you know, it sounds good to them, or it worked in Malawi, it should work in Uganda. Not necessarily. Yeah. So we build the case for doing local research, We'd like to have, you know, maybe comparisons, but we cannot just lift something out of California and implement it in Kampala. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so for me, I guess it's just like you can build a specialization over another specialization. You can also take your childhood fascination with science into becoming a researcher, mm -hmm. and, and you may not become the forensic pathologist, but you still are the person that is going to figure out. You talked about uh, the Kampala trauma score. Yeah. So you don't have the equipment that they have in New York, mm -hmm. but you're treating patients that are as ill as the patients. Mm -hmm. when, uh, because if, if you're hit by a car, yeah. if, if they hit you in Manhattan or if they hit you in Kampala, yeah. the same yeah. energy, yeah. the same injury. Yeah. But in Manhattan, they have super duper hospitals 
and they have tons of nurses and doctors. And in Kampala, I don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. So for me, what drove me to get into that line was, how can I treat the Ugandans that I see on a daily basis so that their outcomes are as good or, or almost as good as the ones I would have if I was working in New York? Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of measures can I use without the, you know, computers at every desk yeah. without, you know, 10 nurses to one patient. And so, well. and on and on, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's seeing the need that you have, asking the questions that, the right questions and going after them to bring the answers that you need. You said something very important that um, having a palais of options, mm -hmm. um, you know, and children now have that opportunity. But sometimes it's just spoken about, like, you know, medicine, fa I don't know, l law, law stuff, medicine. but you don't necessarily know the practicality oh, of right. it. So for me, um, I remember going to a hospital. It was Lira Regional Referral. I'd never really. I mean, there's, there's fancy clinics which have, you know, DSTV and like a sitting room and a water. That, <laughs> that, that doesn't really give you mm. an accurate, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. And so people are treating malaria, so you don't really get to see this incredibly chronic so scenario. Lira, so yeah. I go to Regi Lira Regional Referral Hospital. And I, rem <laughs> and I remember, um, so one of my aunts had just given birth and they're like, oh, this is the maternity ward. But I was quite surprised to see so many, I'd never also seen so many preg like pregnant women. They was in, they were distressed. People had their clothes off. I was like, "What's going on?" My mom's like, "No, that's what labor, you know, labor mm -hmm. pain looks like." But they didn't look really. Um, it didn't look. Uh, it wasn't really great. It was you and your caretaker as the nurse. Mm -hmm. When you're ready, I think then they take you. Mm -hmm. But if you're still not, they give you a hot cup of. So you saw, you saw like women screaming, moving, and people comforting them. I found that quite bizarre. Mm -hmm. But then turning to the extreme, like just I think the left, there was the TB word. And there was a patient who was really honestly, uh, they did not look good. And their mm. skin was, I think it, it can mm. taken off. So I looked at that then, was, in my mind, I remember TB is a killer disease. Now newborn babies are mm. here mm. and there is a TB unit over there. It just didn't, it just didn't make sense. Then we went, went into the, I think surgery, surgery word, the one the yeah. So there was fresh wounds and it smelled, there's a smell that, I remember just seeing legs up, broken parts, and mm. I walked out mm. and I blacked out. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah. How wow. old were you? I was 12. I was 13. Yes, so you were young. But I, rem that, I still remember you. that yeah. because it was just too much pain mm. <laughs> and too much suffering that I don't think you see every day mm. until you're in these spaces and you're seeing like life in its most mm fragile state and it broke I think it broke me and I remember blacking out and I, my mom just said Lona and I said I think medicine not for me. is really not yeah. for me because I just saw too much pain and I I just did not think I could survive pain because I feel like I inherit like I feel like it's I... It's interesting because yeah. people respond to that differently. Yes. Some people see that pain and want to be part of solving. Yes, that's exactly, yeah. So building on what and what you're saying, going back to um, um, speaking of this trauma, because you're exposed to it and it's normal, your no reality. Well, practically it's living that trauma. Living that trauma. Mm -hmm. How are medi... I've always wanted to know how doctors are able to... Is it a compartmentalization? Mm -hmm. How do you... Cope with the cope? day lo loss is in like a reality. <laughs> I don't know. How do you? Is it compartmentalization? How do you? Manage? I think a certain amount of, of compartmentalization happens, but I also think that because you get into it gradually, you learn to to manage it. Mm. So you get into medical school and the first year you do not see patients, you see cadavers. Now, the, now, now even that is becoming, mm, you know, reduced because there's a lot of simulation. And so sometimes in some schools, especially very high uh, end schools, they, they see, they don't see the kind of cadavers that I worked with. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so you don't see people in pain. And then you get to second year, and depending on the you know, on the medical school you're in, they might expose you to a little bit, but still, 
you know. So you get, and then you're in or around a hospital, and so you get used to the smells, you get used to the sounds, you get used to seeing and hearing about these cases. So I think in, in our case, it was a gradual process that by the time you get to be the one that puts on the gloves mm. to, to deal with the wound, mm. you've lived that in some way or form for mm. some time. Right. It's not very, I think for students that now go to these schools that are not in a hospital, it must be different mm. that they, they see simulation, they see it on the screen, but it's different from when you actually interacting with, yeah, the, yeah. with the body. Yeah. So yeah, so by the time you go to the ward, the smells around the hospital, mm -hmm. you don't even think about it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of mental health, I've always imagined, is there a um, mental health accommodation to escort doctors or nurses on their journeys? Because there's also that side of the, the, the story where there's doctors who have found alternative ways to just cope because they have to do their job yeah. and I've always been fascinated especially now when we talk about mental health and I've realized there are people who have been in the deep end um, and that's their 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 profession are those discussions hard or it's um, you just expected to navigate it so those discussions have always been around um, but they became critical during COVID like, and, and in different kinds of branches of medicine, of course, I mean, if you're a dermatologist, if all you treat is skin, skin. diseases, you, yeah, I mean, they can look pretty ugly, mm -hmm. but not many people will die of that. Yeah. And they don't wake you up at two that there's somebody has a, a rash. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there are people that gravitate to those kinds of yeah. those branches yeah. because of, of they, don't, they don't want to deal with the stress. Yeah. And then there are those that are in critical care, that are in obstetrics, that might lose a baby, you know, after nine months, that they're in surgery. So th there you're dealing with almost on a daily basis, um, tragic loss mm. and how one deals with it. So, so over time, it's been realized in the profession that the caregivers need caregivers, that you need to be somebody to care for you mm. or, or you need to be good at realizing when you need help yeah. doctors are not necessarily the best people at that a lot of doctors take it on as they are brave they can do it mm -hmm. until they're really at breaking point mm -hmm. uh, so and and uh, and actually for even before covid uh the, you know the rates of of depression of uh, substance abuse of even suicides have been fairly high amongst the health profession especially mm -hmm. in some types of certain fields of medicine mm -hmm. Uh, but during COVID, it was really bad. Yeah. So now, in a lot of institutions, they have policies around that, around how to how to observe and diagnose, and before somebody tips over, that mm -hmm. you need help. Maybe you should you should get more time off. Uh, you know, limits on the amount of time you can be at work, um, and and how to deal with loss and how to regroup as a unit when you've lost somebody and how to deal with your feelings and to allow people to, you know. I remember uh, you might have heard of Dr. Margaret Mungerera. She, she, was, um, she passed on, but she is one of the, um, I would have to say maybe founders of, of uh, mental health in Uganda. Mm -hmm. And she was very strong on that, the mental health of health workers. Mm -hmm and how health workers should not suffer uh, mental health problems that are unacknowledged. Yes. You know, that you find nurses that are abandoning the profession because they can't cope, yeah. or doctors that are taking, you know, that are abusing substances yeah. and so on, because nobody has dealt with their need for, um, for care. Mm -hmm. So it is a big deal, yeah. it is a big deal. Yeah. Yes. Caregivers. Need, need, need caregivers. Care yeah. yeah. Who are your caregivers? <laughs> Where do you draw? This place is definitely one of them. But please do share. That was um, where I used to like um, I draw, yeah. drawing strength from or drawing that that care as well. So I think um, when I was younger, I think one of the things that helped was having colleagues that. Mm -hmm. that worked alongside you. Mm -hmm. Like when I was uh, doing my uh, surgery, 
Well, we had a we had a group and we watched out for each other mm -hmm. and we knew if somebody lost a patient and they were really devastated and and how to to help them de get over that um or if people were having problems even outside of medicine mm -hmm. you know, family problems and they really couldn't focus on the task because they're having a crisis in their lives mm -hmm. um so i think it was a kind of informal group therapy that maybe goes unacknowledged, but it's really helpful when you're dealing with those kinds of things to have people that know where you, where you stand. Mm. Because maybe it's the same in other fields, but I, I feel that in surgery, because you take responsibility for patients, you have somebody put them under anesthesia, but they're under your knife. You've taken the decision to take them to the OR and you want to bring them back. And so when you, when you lose such a patient, it's only a person who has been in those shoes that can really understand how you feel. And I think that that kind of um, group therapy, when you can get it, is helpful. Uh, it doesn't have to be as extreme as losing a patient in theater. It can be that you really, you know, you've had a massive pain. You know, like in the accident and emergency, sometimes you have, um, you know, you have like lots of patients come in all at the same time. And so you're really just trying to, you know, have a quick evaluation of where are we at, who needs my, we call it triage, who needs what attention now, who can wait, what kind of, you know, so sometimes you, you miss a patient, you know, you don't make the right decision or, or somebody on your team doesn't alert you, and, and so maybe they have a negative outcome mm -hmm. or maybe they end up having delayed surgery. Or so. so it's somebody who understands that, who's been there, that can really understand what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. that can really understand your distress at a, a patient having had a negative outcome when you could have done better. So yeah. I think more recently, it's in some institutions been more formalized that you have counselors that you can go and talk to. Mm. and that you can take time out to, to get over this so that you can be the amazing doctor that you want to be. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it hasn't always been like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what would you say are maybe, you know, some of the telltale signs? Because sometimes it's um, it's mental health, like it's mm. it's in your head, right? It's not but visible. It's not visible. It's not like, oh, I have a shiwundu here, like, you know, put some spirit on, or I don't know, is that, is that to be a proper <laughs> diagnosis? But like, um, because it's, it's, it's intangible. But what are some of the telltale signs that you would, you know, probably pick um, in order to know if someone was going through a, a depression? So it, it depends. And I think that's why knowing the person or being in a group that is caring for each other is really important. Because mm -hmm. if I know Olga to be, um, uh, to be always eager to help, mm -hmm. to be, you know, optimistic, to, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, she's, she's at her job, and then she begins to be snappy, mm -hmm. and she begins to complain about everything, and sometimes she is, absent without reason or she comes in and leaves or she shouts at a patient mm -hmm. you know you're thinking mm, there's something going on there mm -hmm. um or she or something happens that has happened countless times and she didn't cry and she just suddenly <laughs> breaks down in mm -hmm. tears it happens you know mm -hmm. you find a nurse in a corner crying and you're thinking this is not the first time she's lost a baby mm -hmm. but now she just can't deal with point. it yeah. you know so you don't want people to get to that you don't want to you know so you you want to be sensitive to these things so that especially if you're in a, a role where you your team leader you know sometimes you're really driving your team but you want to be sensitive to them as people and to realize that everybody has a tipping point mm -hmm. that, and that sometimes it maybe it's not yours but it's theirs and that we all have different experiences that mm -hmm. you know over time I've built some you know sure. internal yeah but maybe that's not her experience so she may I may say you know what <laughs> you want to take the afternoon off <laughs> mm -hmm. you know so that she can go and deal with whatever she needs to deal with mm -hmm. yeah uh, and to just let people know that when you 
if you don't feel good about it, don't wait, mm -hmm. you know, so, but you can, uh, if, if they are on your team, you can tell, but mm -hmm. can they tell when the team leader needs a break? Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's the problem. That's exactly. the problem. Yeah, and the just strong people. Yeah, the strong people. Check, Check strong on your strong people. friends. <laughs> yeah. Building on what Olga asked. Now, that's the team of men who understand the, the, the profession. Now, we are the the support staff, the family, because that's the thing I've always uh, been quite fascinated about medics. Mm -hmm. Having dealt with the reality of the job every day, a surgery on, and then the rest of us are like, let's meet at legends. Eh? The rest of, for us, we don't, like, so the, the, like, for example, family and um, friends who may not necessarily have front row seats in, 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 in what's happening. How do we, become mindful and support yeah. without saying hey do you need help of course nobody would mm -hmm. yes i think creating an environment where people can talk about things mm -hmm. is good so that they don't feel like this is my cross and when i come home i need just be pleasant and i should never say anything about what happened where i've been all day i think just having a good environment where people can talk and uh, not be judged um, the other thing is to create distractions. So when I was training as a, as a surgeon, much earlier, I, I was introduced to, to squash. Mm -hmm. And squash is a very intense game. Mm -hmm. So I played squash and I actually played it competitively at one time. Mm -hmm. um, and it was for me a good release because you know you can go and, and you're in the court for an hour and while you're there, your mind cannot be anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's on the ball. It's, so it lets you, a certain part of you can, can, can ignore what's going on over there, or what happened, and you can really get some form of, you know, release your tension mm -hmm. because you, you know, you're hitting the ball, you're running, you're on the ball, you're on the ball. And then once you're done, you know, you can. So I, I encourage people, if, if you're in a supportive role, create opportunities for those for, for people to do fun things you know to say you know can we book a squash game or can we book a hike or can we, whatever it, it is that's their medicine you know maybe they like to hike or they like to swim or they like to just go out and you know so that they they are not with their thoughts 24 hours mm -hmm. you know either with the patient or thinking about the patient or going back to the patient or you know it can be endless mm -hmm. <laughs> so for me i found that to be a big uh release you know a big um help that i could you know run from mulago and quite often i would run i would run from mulago go to the to kampala club play squash mm -hmm. and go back okay. yeah that's quite a distance yeah <laughs> Yeah, I used to run when I was younger. Mm -hmm. So I think providing those opportunities and uh, families being, um, because it, it then helps the person to have something else to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, uh, and, and listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listening, okay. sometimes all they want, they don't even want your advice. They mm -hmm. just want somebody that listens and brings a cup of tea mm. <laughs> and listens and some more. more. <laughs>
planned to do that didn't come out exactly the way I planned it. So I think if I were to do it again, it's not the same as if I knew then what I know now. I think uh, what I've what I've learned out of all this is that when I have an opportunity to do something in life, I should do it and do it well. I should learn from it. And so I'll give you an example. So there are times that you've been on a course and you quickly decide that, oh, I really don't care for this, but I have to pass the exam. So you really don't apply yourself to your, to your fullest extent. But you don't really know if you're going to need this information in the future. And I've been in many situations where I found that I could, I was suited for this role because I was at a different point at a different time in my life. I don't know if you know what I mean. So I, I so one time I did work with the Ministry of Health and I was a quality assurance uh, officer. Now quality assurance can be used in any and everything in life, really. But at the time that I was hired to do that job, it was a very specific task. And it seemed as though once I left the Ministry of Health and left the Quality Assurance Unit, I was never going to need that. You would be amazed how much it's helped me in everything that I've done since. And so I guess the point is that when we have, when we are in a place, we embrace it and we get everything that we can out of that moment. Because it's not just for that moment. It's setting you up for another place, another moment when you're going to need this experience. I, I think that's that's what I would say. Yeah. yeah. And and sometimes that experience isn't necessarily for you, but maybe even for someone else. True. I've also been in a situation where somebody needed information and I got it almost as a by the way. It was incidental that I happened to be in a position to get this information. And then I, I say, oh, I know exactly who you need, especially making connections. Yeah. Like I find that you need this person and I met this person in circumstances that were not even related to my job. But because I talk to people, I'm interested in what they do, uh, where they've been. And then I, I know the exact person that you need. Okay. So just, you know, realizing that when you meet people, I think these these are divine appointments sometimes. Like they don't just happen, you know? You didn't just happen to be here and you met so and so and oh by the way, three years from today, when you need something, you know who to contact. So to not let those moments pass. Yeah. I there might have been times in my life when in my younger life when I was too rushed to get to things or to or dismiss things. Maybe I would be more intentional in those moments to say, I'm here for a reason. I shouldn't be in a hurry to dismiss this and to run off and treat it like a chore. Maybe it's teaching me something. Yeah. What she said, so profound around um, almost divine positioning. We've been this, we previously talked about luck. Is there such a thing as luck? Um, do you believe there is? And what does that look like <laughs> from your context? <laughs> is there a place Is there a place for luck as you navigate life? You know, Lona, what they say is that people work for their luck. Like if you, you know, that what is it that, that luck favors a prepared mind? You know, like mm. chance, I think it is. Mm. So when you, when you don't just think, oh, I've just been lucky, when you actually... You know, you prepare, you are where you're supposed to be, you pay attention to people, you help people. Things happen yes. divinely. God sends good people your way because you treat people well. God sends, puts you on an opportunity path because you've not neglected smaller opportunities. Now you get bigger opportunities. So, no, I don't think that it's luck. I think that... <laughs> that God sets people up for yeah. what they experience yeah. if they are sensitive enough to yeah. to embrace the moment. Yeah. yeah. And I think we can also just miss it. 
and think, oh, it's bad luck. But no, we weren't prepared. We didn't listen well enough. We really were, you know, sloppy in our attitude. So then we are unlucky. But no, maybe we there's something we should have done, should have known that we didn't. Yeah, at that point in time, yeah. And, you know, you've given... You've said something so profound to me that takes me back to, I think it's like my favorite <laughs> verse in the whole Bible, um, Ecclesiastes 9-11, you know, the race isn't to the swift, um, and so, and other phrases. But what really picks my attention is time and chance happen to us all. So, you know, there's different opportunities as we, as we go through life that if we're not paying attention, like your time and your chance is happening, but maybe you're not paying, you're not necessarily paying attention yeah, to it because, you're not quite there. Yeah. yeah, or it hasn't packaged itself in a way that you think it's packaged. So you're like, ah, it's just bad luck. Why me? You know, and yet it could be a season of like building your character because mm. your time and chance is coming. Mm. So. So I've been in academia most of my life um, and taught many students, many, you know, medical students, students training to become surgeons, students in, in epidemiology, public health. And you see a student that is really alert, that is, well, that is paying attention. When they get opportunities, they're not lucky. Sometimes you see students that are, they have a good mind, but they're really not paying attention. They are sloppy. You give them an assignment, they, they don't bother. They, they do. And, and then they, I'm afraid, will miss a lot of opportunities in life. So it's not they're unlucky. They just are not applying themselves. Yeah. Yeah. What, what would you say has surprised you the most about life on your journey? <laughs> I think this is going to surprise you, but it, what surprised me about life is growing old. It's, it's like, yeah. so, so for the longest time I was, we, we were young. I mean, if you take, yeah. you take, youth for granted yeah you're young you're yeah. the youngest doctor around you're the young surgeon you're the young this you're the young that and then one day you're not mm. one day they're looking for senior people and they look in your direction you're like excuse me <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what happened yeah. wow me no yeah. you know so i <laughs> i think that surprised me a lot mm. because it, it, it's the changing in roles. Some roles change uh, rather slowly and some roles, you know, it's sort of like you turn a page and from being the junior person, you're the senior person. Mm -hmm. From being the person that you, you, you looked up to seniors to make decisions. No, the decisions are with you. Mm -hmm. The buck stops with you. You're the lead on this and the lead on that. And by the way, you're responsible for that. And, and when they're looking for young people, guess what? They're not looking for you. <laughs> 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 the the That's, application curse of yeah 35 is like the cutoff so like there's some scholarships which you can only apply yeah, for and like 35 so, is the cutoff so thankfully <laughs> I was never caught by those yeah. because I always was ahead you know like yeah. like they'd be looking for 35 and I'll be 28 yeah. so then yeah. I pass through that loop yeah. and then there'd be another loop where they were looking for you know be saying oh the under 40 and I was under 40 and yeah. then there'd be a, you know so there was always some mm. way in which I was young yeah. and then suddenly I'm not anymore yeah. Almost for anything. I'm like, wait. <laughs> what <this> happened? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, but then I, I I have to be thankful and to realize that you know, it's a privilege to 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 then be in this in this phase of my life where I have. I mean, God has given me amazing experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean. Uh, incredible experiences, like places that I've been, people that I've worked with, jobs that I've done, um, tasks that I was entrusted with, and all of these uh, opportunities to learn, to serve, and to grow. 
And so surely I was going to come to the point where I was no longer young. Mm -hmm. I was the senior person. I was the older person. And that should be okay. It's mm -hmm. just that it was surprising how it happened. So mm -hmm. I, I'm truly thankful that mm -hmm. I'm in this position where, you know, and, that when they say 60 and above, I don't feel terrible about it. Mm -hmm. I feel proud because I, I'm like, you know, I've, a former classmate says, Olive, we should be proud because we made it. Yeah. You know, and I'm because he's right, you know, like we we made it, you know, I'm in good health. Mm -hmm. I just get up and go and do what I want to do. And I'm thankful to God for that. Yeah. Um yeah. So what has surprised me is that it's not obvious, but yeah, yeah it's like, wait, really? Me? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's a, that's that's, you know, that's actually beautiful. Yeah. Building on what um, the the there was this I think it's the World Bank that has zero to fifteen and then fifteen to sixty four. Like it's <laughs> that's a big. Yeah, yeah. we are like, yeah, like hey, we follow like, that they sixty four. Zero to fifteen. <laughs> so fifteen to sixty four, we were in the same <laughs> the according same, to same the, the same WhatsApp. Well, it depends yeah. on what the interest and, is. Yes, yeah, because yes. sometimes they're looking at uh, vulnerable. You know. Uh, people who are productive and then people who are depending on those that are productive. Oh, so, well, you know, there might be some 13 year olds that are heading households in Uganda and yeah. that are growing their own food. And so they're not dependent, yeah. but really they are children. Mm -hmm. And, and then mm -hmm. once we are past that, we should be working and not depending on people. Mm -hmm. And if you have a country like Uganda where, you know, we have an incredibly young population, yeah. like, uh, I think 57, 58% of the Ugandan population are children. They are below mm. the age of 18. This is frightening. Yeah. So, so if you have a population pyramid, you know, where you have these masses of people, millions yeah. that are depending on just a few people to be productive, to feed them, house them, educate them, that's a problem. Mm. You know, you have a very big dependent population. Mm. Yeah. So, Dr. Olive, um, I first of all love that you said you're very thankful for how, you know, kind of where you are in life and you're very comfort confident with it um, that, you know, we may be um, at this particular age, but honestly, life has been great based on the achievements that you've been able to. Life has been tough. Oh, wow. But God, great, has, but God has been good. Absolutely. Yes. He's God come through. Been. He's come <laughs> through. Yeah. We've yeah. Lived, I mean, my generation, we've lived through tough times, yeah. you know. We were, as I said, we didn't have any of those gadgets. We grew mm. up in a fairly, you know, what, what now looking back was a healthy childhood mm. where we were allowed to play and experiment and grow without too much stress. But then that didn't last very long. Mm. You know, then there was war upon war upon war. Yeah. So we grew up, you know, when we were teenagers, when we were in our twenties, there was war in this country. There was terrible impoverishment. There was lack, there was need, there was, so it wasn't the kind of comforts that people think of. We didn't have growing up, but then again, maybe we didn't miss them to the extent that some do, because many of them we were completely unaware of. We, mm -hmm. You know, how do you miss a cell phone? We didn't, they didn't <laughs> exist back then. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 So we had real friends. I tell people <laughs> when Facebook came, I say, that's a solution to a problem I don't have. Yeah. I have lots of friends. Yeah. I don't need to, you know. But yeah, so so life was tough in very many ways, but but we you know we stuck together. We we I think we were resilient. This is now a word that's you know thrown about here and there. But I think we were the generation that were resilient. Mm -hmm. it, it's come with a few problems that when we suddenly had a few comforts in life, we've unfortunately not been. We've held them tight and failed to make certain commitments that we could have made. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in my generation, there are many people that will not speak their mind. There are many people that will not, they don't want, they don't want to be in politics because then they, that might cause them problems mm -hmm. because they don't want to lose the comforts of having, you know, basic things like mm -hmm. a house, mm -hmm. a car, a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Uh, they cannot begin to imagine, you know, so, yes. uh, whereas I think a younger generation that maybe takes this for granted is yeah. bolder, vocal. is more vocal, yeah. is more, and I think that's a good, I think that my generation lost that. We mm -hmm. are too fearful, um, 
Yeah, we do not like confrontation. Mm. We do not like to take risks. We do not like to take risks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, too, too much at stake. Yeah. Terrible. Risk is yeah. good. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Um, um, because b- bringing me to my next question to you, um, Dr. Olive, you've mentioned your, yeah, the, 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 your generation. Of course, there's those elements of you are resilient, um, but very risk averse. Um, just based on the dynamics of the times, um, the fragility of our this is security, maybe as a country. So there's that fear and need to protect and just be, let's be safe and be peaceful. Mm-hmm. What would you then describe was or is your generation's mandate? And um, just looking back, would you say it has been? realized or is it still in the process of being realized so i think i think my generation i, I don't want to say this too loudly <laughs> some of my friends would not like it but i think we've let ourselves down and we've let the country down i think that we had a real opportunity to change the direction in which the country was headed um, as I said, we, we were at university when the NRA were in the bush. Mm. So we were stepping off the plate when, when you know, the NRA came and we, we were very hopeful. Well, I write about it in my book, The Correct mm. Line. We were very, there was a lot of hope. Um, not just... For my g- generation, but for the older people and, and, and then the, the subsequent generations. But, and so what, what do I think was my mandate? I was, was our collective mandate is that I think, uh, based off of the fact that, you know, we had had independence in 62 and a lot of things that had been envisaged hadn't happened and we had, the privilege of that, uh, that experience, the information, the education, that we could have done things differently, mm. that we could have set the country on a different path. Uh, for instance, on a path of non-violence, because up until that point, mm-hmm. governments were changing because somebody had a faster gun. Yeah. Mm. And, and have we done that? No, we still are ruled by guns. Mm. We still have not had a change of government unless somebody shot their way to power. Mm. We still have um, t- t- totally messed up elections. Mm. So we really have not changed the dynamic. Mm. And I think having been given 40 years and having failed to do that, we can, how can we say that we've... Mm. Oh, actually, we haven't. Yeah. <laughs> I really think yeah. that we dropped the ball, mm. unfortunately, and we are quickly running out of time to do it. Mm. I think we are getting to the point where we can't be trusted with that. Mm. We haven't used our time well, and we need to admit that and let younger people run with it. Mm. Mm. Do we sit back and do nothing? No, we still have a role. Mm. There are many things that we know that you don't, mm. and there are many lessons that we can share, and and there are things that we can still do. <coughs> Excuse me, but I mm. think that we really have wasted time. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, building on what you just said, there's lessons that you can still share that will help again, whether it's redirect or um, you know, again take the continent, the country, but also the continent. Uh, because now, um, like you say, rightfully, in the 1960s, there was that Pan-African, um, and it was cut across, like Africa alive, you know, one Africa, that, that sense of Africanness. Um, today, we're also seeing that same energy-ish, but this time it's not necessarily driven by it's not a, it's not politically driven it's also not necessarily economically driven but um and it's being themed the african renaissance this time it's really um that dynamism that vibrancy that cultural creativity so we are seeing the arts the music fashion come back in um as as a, a, as an asset to really you know rally Africanness or one Africa, you know, a sense of self. What would you say are those three recommendations that you would share to this generation? Um, whether it's like handing on a, 
what is it called? Abattoir. 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 Um, yes, the race is in your hands. However, these are these these are the lessons that we'd love to share and um, how to definitely mm-hmm. take mm-hmm. that on. Yeah, very keen uh, to hear. Uh, well, that's that's a that's a complex question. That's a complex question, and I'll tell you what. So you said this new energy. That's bubbling. Is is not necessarily politically driven. It's not even economically driven. Um, and you think it's somewhere in the arts. <laughs> okay, go on. Yeah. 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 Feel free to share Think, your opinion. Yes. This is a safe space. Yeah. Yes. That that is not entirely true. I think that there's a lot that is happening on the continent that is driven by economics mm-hmm. that young people are finding ways of doing things that that older generations hadn't quite caught on so for instance when you see how finance is run mm-hmm. finance and communication that the connection between those two sectors that you have uh, a communications company that is now loaning money that is mm-hmm. you know there's there's certain things the way money moves around um this is new. This is new. And it's not just new in Africa. I think it's a global thing. So so there's going to be a lot that happens that is enabled, even in the arts, that is enabled because there's a certain type of economics that's going on, mm-hmm. that, it, that the arts are not sitting alone. Yeah. So, for instance, when you see how, um, uh, you know, like concerts Mm -hmm. you know you think it's an it thing but it's also an economic thing Mm -hmm. you see how data moves about how data is collected how you know you you're playing a song but somebody is gathering data about your interests and they're going to use that data to be able to sell you some software and a different type of phone they're going to sell you a type of holiday based on what you just bought so there's there's the Interlinkages are so intense, mm. so intense, that it's very difficult, I think, to separate the e- economics from the arts, from politics. finance, mm. even from politics. Mm. And I think that certain things can only be enabled when the politics is right. Mm. And if the politics is not right, those sectors are not going to succeed. So I would be, I would be hesitant to say that we can close our eye to the politics because these other areas are thriving. They will not thrive. Mm-hmm. The reason why we are in a ditch now is because we've gotten our politics wrong. Yeah. And there's, I mean, Ugandans are amazing. Africans may be generally, you know, we are hopeful, we are optimistic, we are innovative, we are all of these things. We really, you know, we are beaten into a power and the following day we get up and walk. Mm. You know, we are always coming back. We don't give up. If that spirit was happening where there was uh, sensible politics, mm. we would be way so ahead. Mm. But we are operating in a situation where... Um, there's no rule of law. You mm-hmm. can't, if you invest and somebody robs you, you can't get, you know, you have no recourse. You, yeah. you know, it, so, so the kind of stifling that that does to business, for instance, or even to the arts. I mean, people, concerts are disbanded, you know, by military people. Mm-hmm. Somebody puts on a concert and because they might be singing the wrong thing according to someone, they're going to be tear gas. Yeah. So the arts are not entirely free of the politics. Yeah. And I think until you sorted your your governance issues, the other issues are always going to, to struggle because they, they have to be subservient. They have to they have to say the correct words in order mm-hmm. to exist. Censorship. Yeah. Serious censorship, you know? Yeah. So and and so creativity is stifled by censorship. Mm-hmm. And when it's been going on as long as it's been, then self censorship comes to the fore. Now we don't even want to think I can't think it because yeah. then I'm going to say it or write it. Then yeah. I'll be in trouble. Yeah. So, so no, I think that those, those threads, they are all threads and they are running together. Mm. They're intertwined okay. and they are, none of this is going to succeed when something else is grossing wrong. If you don't have the money 
you're not going to, the arts cannot thrive. Yeah. You know, yeah. you need the money for the arts to thrive. You need a certain freedoms in order for the arts to thrive, in mm-hmm. order for commerce to thrive, in order for education to thrive. You know, so I, I think that we need the, the enthusiasm. I like it. And uh, as I said, maybe our generation are risk averse and maybe you are more bold, more daring, but don't limit yourselves to, okay, we are only going to do the arts. We really do not want to mess with the politics. Mm -hmm. Because that's also one of the things that this, our generation finds itself, um, whether it's escapist really to Block, like, block it's like the, a blocker. you know, this, 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 this other side that we actually need to be more involved in the decision, the policy making that actually shapes the country. So there has been, um, that I think that laxity in when we are comparing the generation. So we have opted for more kind of escapist, um, escapist roots, and I think that's 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 where we are seeing a lot of that, and less people interested in actually participating in. Um, um, positions, key positions that shape, shape, shape the country's um, vision. Yeah, I think it's very short-sighted, mm-hmm. and I think uh, if if you don't if you don't get to address this squarely, head on, then you're always going to be playing on the fringes. You're not going to actually be drivers of these things. Mm-hmm. So you find um, that because you're you're now you're now not just thinking Uganda, you're thinking the bigger region, maybe East Africa, maybe Africa, and and internationally, you're competing against somebody in Malaysia and somebody in Australia. When you're building your app, you're not building your app competing with a Ugandan. Yeah. You know, there are many other people that are seeing the problem you're seeing, and they're trying to solve it. You're all trying to solve the same problem, maybe. Mm-hmm. And those people are going to get further ahead if their politics is right, if their governance is right. Yeah, here we're still struggling with copyright. With mm-hmm. and, and these are things that we, you can't solve on your own. You need a system. Yeah. And in Uganda and, and other countries where the politics um, has been very limiting is that we don't have a sense of the common good. Everybody, you know, people work for themselves. Yeah. People work for themselves. People, you know, you find on a terrible road, almost impassable, and somebody builds a house, and then they they tarmac the section from this terrible road <laughs> to their gate, like a yeah. yeah. hundred meters of tarmac in the yeah. middle of nowhere. Yeah. Like, how is it we cannot fix a road? The road is, you know, even yeah, in ancient civilizations, yeah. paths were commonly oh, yeah. owned. Yeah. Nobody owned a path, a path to a well, a path to the yeah. to the healer, or mm. a path to a mountain, wherever. Mm. But now we don't want to put resources in building roads because then the road is serving everyone. Mm-hmm. But you want all the money to serve you and your family. So you build mm-hmm. this huge, you know, fort. Mm-hmm. It has no road going to it. Mm-hmm. You know, how is that possible? Mm-hmm. The, the, the level of selfishness of greed is really shocking. Yeah. And so when systems allow for that type of greed, eventually even innovation in other fields will, will suffer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What color would you use to describe the future based on this remix of their yeah, experiences and, 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 and life? <laughs> We're sitting in such beautiful surroundings. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tempted to say green. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, well, the future of what? Of the country? Yes. Oh, generally? Generally. Uh, it reminds me of a, a, a childhood book, a kindergarten book that talks about colors and, and what mm. colors represent, you know. Mm. Uh, so sometimes you're thinking uncertainty and you're thinking maybe it's gray. You know, we always say it's neither black nor it's uncertain. There's a certain amount of uncertainty in gray. So maybe one is tempted to say it's, we don't quite know where it's going. Mm. But there's something unsettling about what's happened to Uganda and to Africa generally, and that's the popu- the that's our population, 
a population dynamic. We are a very young continent. Yeah. Mm. And young is energy, mm. is passion, but it can also be anger mm. if, if all these young people have no education, no jobs. And so I, in thinking about the future, I think about what are we doing, even just Uganda, what are we doing with these millions of young people mm. that we've not educated that who have no jobs, they are unemployed or even unemployable. They have no skills. Mm. Um, hungry. There is not going to be much green and blue with those people. There's mm. going to be more like red, yeah. like and rage. Yeah. Rage. So yeah. I don't know. I yeah. so I don't know about colors, but yeah. yes. That's yeah. I think turbulence, mm. uncertainty, but maybe if we don't get it right, a certain amount of turbulence, mm. I would say. Mm. Mm. And if we get it right? <sighs> we really have to hunker down and work really hard. Mm. We have to work really hard because it's a, it's, it's a huge task. It's mm. a momentous task. Mm. Because when you have such young a young population, it means that you, you want to get their health right you want to get the education right. You want to educate them, to, to, to train them, skill them, and, and so they are employable. Mm. And then you're sorted. Currently, I don't see that happening. Mm. We have a, an education system that does not address our needs, mm. that it seems to be blind to where we are as a country. Mm. So, yeah, we need to change a lot of things quickly to get that right. right. Mm. Love that. Yeah. And then bring it Closer to home, what color would you use to describe your life? So far. <laughs> a green. A green. <laughs> um, I wish I could say green. Yes, but, um, I don't know. Green is associated with what? With, with stability? Mm. With calm. With calm. What about blue? Isn't that also calm? calm. Tranquil? Tranquil. Mm. Yeah. Peaceful. I, I I don't know. I mean, royalty. Oh, yeah, like royal blue. Yeah, <laughs> royalty. <laughs> um, so I have, unlike thinking about the future for the country mm. where it's infinite, mm. I have lived my 60 something years. And so looking back, I can say that while there were many things that could have gone wrong, and some things did go wrong. But God's grace, I am here mm -hmm. having done what I did, having helped a few people maybe. So what color would that be? Mm -hmm. um, it surely has to be something between... Um, I, I like blue, but no, let me not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would like to go with blue. Blue, go with okay. Blue. Blue. I like that. Blue it is. I like that. Yeah. So, oh wow, we have come to the end of our very fascinating discussion. Any parting shot from you, Dr. Olive? Um, if you're going down the books of history, what would you want to be remembered for? Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> It's interesting, you know, what people are remembered for. Sometimes it's not even the things they set out to do or the things they thought were the most important. Um, why I say this is... So, for instance, when people meet me and they say, you know, introduce yourself, I could have said, oh, I'm Dr. So-and-so. And so and when I was in academia, I would say, oh, I'm on faculty at Makere University, or oh, I'm head of this and this, or oh, I'm director of that and that. And then all that ceases, and mm. when all that is removed, what remains? Yeah. And I think that that sometimes is the more important, that I did all of the things that I did um, as a surgeon, as a researcher, as a teacher, as a mentor, to help people. And I think I would like to keep helping people regardless of what it is that I do. Mm. Uh, in this case, I I helped people the most in my role as a doctor. So maybe that's relevant. Yeah. Uh, 
for Uganda and maybe for the region, one of my pioneering areas were injury prevention, was injury prevention. So I indeed am known for that. I think I was the first injury epidemiologist in the region. Mm -hmm. And I trained the other injury epidemiologists that are now here. Wow. So mm -hmm. I would, I would say that if, if there are some, if there's something that people remember me for is the idea that injuries are preventable, mm -hmm. that we do not think they are accidents. They didn't just happen. Mm -hmm. There are many things we can do to prevent, protect people from injuries. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the one thing. And one does not even have to be a surgeon or a doctor to do that. Yeah. You know, many people can prevent injuries when they're not even doctors. So, mm. yeah. so wow. Yeah. wow, 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 wow. Yeah. And with that, we've come to the end of our lovely conversation. conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Olive. It has been incredibly insightful. Um, your journey, deeply inspiring, not just to us, but to generations to come. And we really hope that um, this story gets to as many ears as <laughs> possibly can. Yeah. And to our audience, please um, grab the patient and the correct line at Mahiri by Dr. Olive Kobusinje. Fantastic books. And um, there's an upcoming book. Mm -hmm. when do we expect it or in the works <laughs> um, in the works yes but in addition to this there is also um there is um yeah she's a you're a three-time you're a three-time author and um looking forward to the the next the next book in addition to that we are also at the great outdoors a fantastic place in um in Gaiaza, Gaiaza, zero way um, <laughs> yes, area. Please do visit with uh, friends, family. Um, Christmas is down the line. Um, there's lots of activities um, on the site. A fantastic pool, of course, to relax. But in addition to that, there's walking trails. Um, there's a cycling path. It's really for the adventure packed um, lover and those who are looking for peace and trunk tranquility. tranquility. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's the great outdoors. And um, we shall add the contacts in the link below thank you very much it's a pleasure to talk to you